Thank you for that kind introduction, Joel, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here at Community Church of New York, where my Metropolitan Philharmonic Chorus made its debut in June 1988 with my Rosenberg guitar. In fact, Joel, do you have a copy of this? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to give one to the church if they have a music collection. Is Esther here? It can go into the bookstore or bookstore. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll put it here. Okay. And this is uh, the same building where, I, as Joel mentioned, I've conducted the choir of the Metropolitan Synagogue, first in 1979, and then more recently at the High Holidays this past September. Thank you for inviting me to give this series of lecture seminars on a subject dear to my heart, dedicated to the memory of a person dear to my heart, my mother, Emily R. Lehrman, who passed away one week ago today. We buried her on Sunday, and while under other circumstances my wife, Helene Williams, and I might be at home sitting shiva this week, I know my mother, who was a terrific fan of opera, especially my operas, would, <laughs> would want us to be where we are here, doing what we're doing today, honoring her memory, talking about playing and sharing what we know and love about the history, genesis, and riches of Jewish opera. And my mother was also an extremely strong voice of social consciousness, which is one of the focal points of this lecture, showing how Dr. King, Ellie Siegmeister, Mark Lidstein, and Leonard Bernstein all propelled me in the direction I took, studying and writing Jewish operas. Last semester, as Joel mentioned, I taught at Hebrew Union College downtown what I believe was the first course ever given anywhere in Jewish opera, a dream I'd had for about 35 years. And my introductory lecture was similar to my lecture here today. My second lecture was attended by Sheldon Harnick and Joel, and was, we thought, quite successful. Helene videotaped both lectures, and we posted them on YouTube. I also sent transcripts of them to the students with links to videos of operas that they could watch if they so wished, only excerpts from which I had time to include in the lectures. Unfortunately, Joel, who has a lot more experience teaching than I do, thinks maybe I scared them by offering them so much material to look at. Three of the four students registered for the course decided they didn't have time for it, and that was that. Disappointment was expressed by the school administration, but also especially by all the composers I'd invited to come share their music in class. Fortunately, one of those composers, Joel, came to the rescue with a small grant from his Maldev Foundation, and now at least some of those composers I'd invited will be joining us at subsequent sessions on Wednesdays in February, March, April, and May. In my first lecture on Jewish opera, for the Jewish Music Roundtable of the Music Library Association at its 1996 Seattle Convention. It was later published in Aufbau and Opera Journal. I distributed a list of close to 2,000 works that could be called Jewish operas. And this in turn inspired a book by Kenneth Jaffe called Solo Works, Solo Vocal Works on Jewish Themes, a bibliography of Jewish composers in which he limited the number of pieces examined to those on Jewish themes by Jewish composers. I had included everything by Jewish composers or by anybody on Jewish themes. Now, Neil Levin, in his essay on the subject Jewish opera for the Milken Archive of American Jewish Music, considers the religion of the composer to be unimportant. I don't, but I do consider borderline, a work like Jack Beeson's only unproduced opera on a very Jewish libretto by Paul Goodman, Jonah as well as Ludovico Roca's Il Dibuk, which uses Jewish themes. And we'll be discussing that work, along with a number of other Dibuk treatments, including one by Joel, in my second lecture, February 25th. For Women's History Month, March 18th, we'll be discussing biblical women with Elizabeth Suedos and Elizabeth Hoffman. And around the time of Yom HaShoah, April 22nd, we'll have David Amram and others, including Joel, talking about their Holocaust operas. In my 1996 lecture, I also considered other questions like, what is an opera? Is it a work that a composer calls an opera? Or what, what if other people call it that? The National Opera Association considered my 
E.G., a musical portrait of Emma Goldman, an opera, and presented it as such at their 1990 convention in Chicago. On May 13th, which happens to be the day before the 75th anniversary of the death of Emma Goldman, we'll study that work, which, is, which was inspired by Howard Zinn's play, Emma, along with an opera based on the Zinn play, which has never been produced. Its composer, Elaine Fine, will be flying in from Illinois to join us for that occasion. Emma Goldman, by the way, has a direct connection with the community church. How many of you know the name Emma Goldman? Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover called her the most dangerous woman in America and had her deported in 1919. It took a committee headed by Roger Baldwin of the American Civil Liberties Union to bring her back, even just for a visit in 1934. One of the members of that committee was John Haynes Holmes. See, that's the connection. Yesterday, the nation commemorated the 86th birthday of Martin Luther King. And believe it or not, it was his I Have a Dream speech that acted as a catalyst in the creation of a number of Jewish operas in which I became involved personally. That's what I'm going to tell you about today. In September 1960, I became the youngest and longest private student of the composer Elie Siegmeister. My mother took me to him, having been recommended by her cousin Rose Cabot, who will be 100 years old this coming March 17th, and who worked with him, Mordecai Bauman, and Mark Blitzstein in the Workers' Music League in the 1930s. On August 28, 1963, my father took me to the March on Washington, which affected me very deeply. I can still hear Rabbi Joachim Prince proclaiming the significance of our American Jewish heritage in the pursuit of justice. And of course, A. Philip Randolph's introduction to the moral leader of our time, Dr. Martin Luther King, who gave the speech of the century. Now, Elie Siegmeister wasn't there, but I told him about it. And in 1966, Cantor Solomon Mendelssohn commissioned him to make that speech into a cantata to be premiered by William Warfield and a racially mixed choir at Saul's Synagogue, Congregation Beth Shalom in Long Beach, Long Island. Elie Siegmeister was a very socially conscious composer already. He had championed the works and messages of Charles Ives, Hans Eisler, proletarian music in the 1930s, like his songs, The Scottsboro Boys Shall Not Die, and Strange Funeral in Braddock. Folk music with his American ballad singers and Broadway shows Sing Out Sweet Land in the early 1940s, Soviet music in the late 1940s. But the 1950s, he had undergone a change of style, as much of American music did, resulting from and in a distinct bitterness experienced and expressed, as the Cold War and McCarthyism had a paralyzing effect on so many intellectuals who had previously looked to socialism for guidance and ideals to strive for. The civil rights movement seemed to represent a new burgeoning of idealism, especially in its unity of progressives, American, African Americans, and Jews. I'm not tearing up a little bit because I know by the way. I'm be crying about that. She, she, she worked for the American Soviet Medical Society. <clears throat> and then got herself on the, on the her attorney general's list as a result of doing that. So she could never have a job as a teacher because she couldn't take a loyalty oath without lying. That's why she became a librarian. Anyhow, Ellie didn't know very much about Jewish music, so he asked Kander Mendelssohn for guidance. And as Saul told me in an interview, Ellie took what I gave him and improved upon it. And some of you may be familiar I'm sure Joel is, with chants used in blessing the Torah and the half Torah. So listen to the, this passage uh, of, where Ellie sets the uh, chorus singing uh, in response to the, to the uh, speaker. Asking, when will you be satisfied?
made a victim of brutality and terror. No, we cannot be satisfied. So long as anyone, when he travels, is refused a place to eat and sleep, we can never be satisfied. So long as anyone can be turned away by signs reading it for whites only, we never can be satisfied. So long as anyone in the South cannot vote, and anyone in the North believes he has nothing for which to vote. Short but pointed passage taken right from the trope, the, the can, can, cantorial cantillation. It was, in a sense, Elias Barment's photo. <laughs> <laughs> the timing of the premiere, on April 16, 1967, was unfortunately was unfortunate. However, twelve days after Dr. King's Riverside Church speech denouncing the war in Vietnam. Suddenly, Dr. King became persona non grata in many circles. The American Legion threatened to picket the synagogue if he showed up. Senators Jacob Javits, Robert Kennedy also quickly declined invitations. Jackie Robinson, Ossie Davis, and Ruby Dee were there, as was I with my parents, but the major press stayed away. As I wrote in my bio-bibliography of Siegmeister, The cantata really only came into its own. On January 15, 1989, Dr. King's 60th birthday and Elie Siegmeister's 80th birthday the same day, when Bill Warfield flew in from Chicago and repeated his performance, this time under my direction, with my Metropolitan Philharmonic Chorus at the Harlem School of the Arts. That was actually the second performance of the chorus, the first one being here the previous June. And that's, that's the performance of this piece of the I Have a Dream cantata that's on YouTube. Even before writing I Have a Dream, Ellie had become intensely interested in the interaction of Jews and African Americans and wanted very much to make Bernard Malowitz's short story, Angel Levine, into an opera. However, his colleague Mark Glitzstein got there first. Does the name Mark Glitzstein mean anything to you? Good. I think there were two people said yes and the rest of them didn't. Okay. So define a bit. I will. Mark Blitzstein and his composer, about whom I've also written a book, <laughs> um, as well as editing three volumes of his songs. Yeah, I have that here. I can see some pictures of him. Um, he was a, a, a Nadia Boulanger student, like Siegmeister, and later a friend and mentor of Leonard Bernstein. Blitzstein also had been interested in music for workers. In fact, Ellie often told the story of Marx approaching him in the library in 1934, asking, what is this proletarian music all about? Blitzstein's most famous works were his proletarian opera, The Cradle of Rock, his Broadway opera, Regina, and his translation of the Brecht Vial, Three Penny Opera. His magnum opus, Sacco and Vanzetti, commissioned by the Ford Foundation and optioned by the Metropolitan Opera. He worked on for a number of years in New York, in Italy, and for several months during a visit to Israel. And it was during that, that trip that Woodstein began, like Siegmeister, to think about his own Jewish identity. In 1962, he took a job teaching at Bennington College, and there encountered Bernard Malamud, who was on the English faculty, and with whom he became very good friends. Ned Roram later characterized Malamud as Blitzstein's ideal collaborator. Now, Malamud told me that said collaboration consisted of his giving Blitzstein a number of his stories he'd written and then leaving him alone. <laughs> Maybe that was indeed the ideal collaborator Blitzstein was looking for. <laughs> Blitzstein envisioned setting a number of those Malamud stories to music as a set to be called Tales of Malamud, like Tales of Hoffman, not like Washington Irving's Tales of the Alhambra, which my editors were apparently thinking of when they miswrote on the contents page of my Blitzstein bibliography, Tales of the Malamud. <laughs> Malamud, of course, it, is approximately the same word in Hebrew as Lehrman is in Yiddish, so the mistake was kind of funny, actually. The, the question of who would set Angel Levine to music became moot, though, when Malamud sold the rights to the movies. The film with Harry Belafonte and Zero Mostel was not a great success, but it's still worth watching. Blitzstein decided that two other tales would make a full evening, Idiots First and Magic Barrel. Unfortunately, he died in January 
1964, without completing either of them. But on the suggestion of Ellie Siegmeister, and with Leonard Bernstein's blessing, I completed and orchestrated Idiots First, along with 20 other Blitzstein works, including Sacco and Vanzetti, and a short chamber work called Discourse, which Joel plans to premiere at Queen's College on April 1st. Joel, not, let me not forget. Here's the score. <laughs> Now, with all that as help, we're going to watch the, the video, the only video today, of the only extant song from Blitzstein's Magic Barrel. It's called Then. It's a monologue for the matchmaker's daughter, a prostitute, waiting at a lamppost for a date with a rabbinical student who's fallen in love with her. Erin Passmore sang it two years ago at the Halifax Summer Opera.